Hello, everyone, and welcome to Make the World Prosthetics. This is a month-long program that we're doing here at Adafruit Industries in partnership with Google and MakerBot and uh, programs like RoboHand, the Open Hand Project, uh, Anthromod, Prosthetics for Prosperity, Enabled, the Lucky Fin Project, and Hands for Africa. Uh, this is all about crowdsourcing and sharing designs and getting new ideas for 3D printed prosthetics and getting them to people who need them. Uh, tonight we have some amazing guests that have uh, been part of this from the start. We have people that are in the industry uh, that are doing this, and we have experts in 3D printing and electronics. Um, with us tonight is... Hello, I'm Lamar Freed. I'm the founder and engineer of Adafruit, and I'm kind of interested in what kind of electronic sensors and outputs we can attach to prosthetics. I know that we have uh, high-end robotic prosthetics from companies like DECA and... Um, uh, sea leg and, and similar, but what can hobbyists do to get uh, gyro accelerometers, motors, feedback sensors, LEDs, whatever they want, uh, embedded into their awesome prosthetics? Hi, my name is Michael Curry. I'm the 3D printing evangelist from MakerBot Industries. Um, I became involved in the RoboHand project several months ago when I contributed to the project through uh, making a snap fit version of the original RoboHand. The concept that I was exploring was really making it something that was much easier to approach in terms of rapidly printing it, building it, experimenting with it, but more of a launching point than a finished thing. Not a perfect version, and I've been fascinated to see what other people have made from this design. I'm Matt Griffin, the Director of Community and Support here at Adafruit, and uh, very passionate about not only 3D printing um, as an activity, but the community of people who are coming into this space and just making amazing things happen uh, together by sharing things. OK. And Ivan? Please Hello. Uh, I, I'm Ivan Owen from uh, Bellingham, Washington, which is in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm a uh, basically a mechanical special effects artist, but I, I, I was involved in the RoboHand project um, creating the, uh, the initial uh, design for, for the RoboHand, which was later um, taken and enhanced upon by uh, various uh, t talented designers. And I've been now excited by exploring how 3D printing can work into the world of education, and also just the excited to watch as, as this technology grows and see where it, where it uh, goes from here. Great. And Molly, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Molly Stapleman. I'm from Royal Oak, Michigan, which is about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. I am the founder of the Lucky Fin Project. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that aims to raise awareness and celebrate those who are born with congenital limb differences, particularly hand differences. Um, I'm really excited about uh, this Make the World Project um, because I want to share information with our community and give um, our children, our adults, and our families the best opportunities they can have um, to leave a full and, and happy life. All right. And Paul? Hi, I'm Paul McCarthy. This is my son, Leon McCarthy. We uh, saw the work that Ivan and Richard Van Oss did uh, with the uh, RoboHand online and uh, ventured out to build our own version of it, which we called the Frankenhand. <laughs> And, uh, and and had a lot of fun and success uh, building it as a, a father-son team. That's fantastic. OK, well, to start this off, what we wanted to do is spend a little bit of time with each person and talk about what they've been working on, um, some of the challenges, some of the things that they would love for people out there to help out with, and uh, next steps. Um, this is all about generating ideas. And uh, this is just the beginning of. Uh, a month-long effort, but we hope this is a continuing conversation that will be posted on Google+, Plus. that'll be shared, that'll be on Thingiverse, that'll be um, something that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, in the Adafruit community, um, we have a community called Artists, Hackers, uh, Artists and Engineers. We wanted to have a big group of people that uh, had lots of ideas and lots of um, uh, diverse backgrounds, and so we're really excited that this is um, uh, one of the first times that we've been able to pull in a big group of people that have so many different skill sets and they have uh, so different locations, different needs, and uh, with 3D printers now becoming accessible for a lot of people, um, this is one of the things that they can be used for that can truly uh, help individuals. So uh, with that, Ivan, tell us how you uh, got to where, where you're at with uh, uh, building 3D printing prosthetic hands. 
Um, well, uh, it was. Uh, it started when I uploaded a uh, video of a really silly giant um, costume hand that I had built for just a personal project. Um, I ended up receiving a, an email from Rich um, where he had seen the video and uh, told me about the nature of an accident that he had had, and he invited me to collaborate with him on the design for some sort of mechanical finger prosthesis. Um, and then it just kind of uh, progressed from, from there. Um, eventually, uh, there was a suggestion made by one of my coworkers at the time to look into 3D printing, contacted MakerBot and told them what it was that we were up to and trying to accomplish. And uh, amazingly, the, the word back was that they would be willing to, uh, to uh, provide us with two printers to experiment with, which was uh, unbelievably awesome. Um, and then we took what we had already been working on and translated it into the digital world and, uh, you know, created a... Um, at first, it was a pretty rough rough framework. It looked boxy and things like that, and that's where uh, it was later improved upon. And so it's just been a really exciting thing. Uh, lately, what I've been working on, um, in particular with, with Paul and Leon, is the idea of how to, to take the initial success of the design and adapt it in some sort of way to make it as easy as possible for people to build themselves at home like Paul and Leon did, and uh, and their knowledge in that area is excellent because they're folks that, that did just that, so they have some really interesting perspectives on, on things that can be done to uh, make it more user-friendly, essentially. Okay, great. And uh, after we do um, some of the background, uh, we're going to switch to our overhead camera, and maybe our team here, we have a whole assortment of uh, 3D printed prosthetic cans. Maybe uh, we can uh, talk about some of these, but um, let's go to Molly now. Molly, how did you get involved with this? Um, well, I run the Lucky Fin project, so uh, I, I heard from Google Plus about the Make the World project and heard about all the great things you were doing, and I think I have the audience that you guys are looking for um, because that's, those are our kids. They're, they're born with either out digits or limited digits, um, and so I, um, I was really curious to hear more about this. There's been a lot of buzz about RoboHand. Um, lots of links on YouTube, um, and I know that our community um, in general is very, very curious, curious about it. And um, a tool like RoboHand is a completely different sort of prosthetic um, that will give use to kids that wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for a traditional prosthetic. Um, so th this is just a really interesting um, development for our community, and I think there's a lot of interest and in a lot of and the fact that it is so inexpensive, and that they can be made and shipped anywhere is fantastic. Um, so to have something so readily available um, to the, a, a very um, celebratory, enthusiastic community is great. Um, just in in sharing the information about um, Lucky Finn being part of the Make the World project, I've already received emails from um, interested parents. So going forward, we'll have to see where everything leads and um, if we'll be able to assist them with this. That's great. And um, I had read that you have sent thousands of bracelets around the world. Um, <laughs> what what is that all about? And 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 where did these bracelets come from? Um, I make them all myself. Um, the that's how our project all got started. Um, I don't know if you can see. No. <laughs> yeah. um, back in, um, my daughter was born in 2007, and she, um, she was born with an unexpected hand difference. Um, she's missing, well, she's born without, I don't like missing, but she's born without four fingers on her right hand, and she has a smaller, shorter thumb, and the bones um, in her palm are, are also shorter in her right hand. We had no knowledge of this prior to her birth. Um, perfectly normal pregnancy. Um, found out in the hospital um, very little information. It was like pulling teeth. Um, and as I shared my experience later with other parents in support and chat rooms, I found that my experience was incredibly common. It didn't matter how big or small the hospital, if it was United States based, UK based, Greece, Australia, it happens over and over. Um, there's just a, a real gap in the initial um, medical care or the um, sharing medical information. They just really don't tell you anything until you find a specialist, but they don't necessarily direct you towards a specialist either. Um, all that said, um, I uh, my daughter saw these beads one day when we were out at a at a local shop, and she said, "Mommy, those look like Nemo." 
And if you've ever seen the movie Finding Nemo, Nemo is a clownfish, which is orange and white, and he was born with one fin smaller than the other. And his father called it affectionately his lucky fin, and that's kind of we kind of picked up on that and called Ryan's um, right hand her lucky fin since she was little. Um, it's very relatable to other kids when they come up and ask what happened to her hand, um, things like that. So she saw the bead. I told her she could pick one out, and I'd make her a lucky fin bracelet. She picked out five. Um, I made five bracelets, and those were initially distributed to um, friends I met in chat rooms who had children like my daughter. Um, and we started with five in 2010, and now we're over 48,000. Wow. Um, and, yeah, <laughs> it's grown to be much more than I ever expected. And with the, the money that people donate for the bracelets, we've been able to create awareness brochures that we now send out to the hospitals so um, parents can at least have a guide and some information um, about their child's difference and they don't feel so alone. Fantastic. And you're using, this is all because of the Internet and connecting with other people, and that's how the word is getting out? Yep. It's all, it's all been social network, Facebook oh. and Twitter. That's fantastic. Yeah, yep. when um, we heard there was an opportunity to talk about 3D printing and prosthetics, um, we thought, wow, what a, uh, what a neat time because you can get so much information out there. You can download the files, you can share, and you can have someone in one area of the world uh, come up with a part or a design and then they can uh, send it across the internet um, or they can be downloaded and they can uh, uh, print it out and try it right there. And do do yeah. you have people in your community that are 3D printing uh, prosthetics for their kids. Sounds like you have 48,000 people. That's a lot. It, you know, that sounds like it spans a, a wide group of people. It'd be interesting to hear what your community is doing right now. Well, right now we have a few people who have received um, or have gotten a robo hand, um, and I've I've talked to them to see how it was. It's been going with them, um, but so far not very many people have it have have one yet. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of a lot of people with traditional prosthetics, um, but very few who are, have um, used the robo hand. So this is a great opportunity um, for our community to learn more about it, and um, and then if they choose to to get one themselves and try it out. Okay, fantastic. Okay. And speaking of, Paul. Paul. And friend, and assistant. And, and Leon. <laughs> Paul and Leon. Well, you know, everything you were saying there, I, I had it on mute because I got uh, intoxicated relatives in the background. <laughs> the best type of relatives. <laughs> when you were saying that and you were like in the hospital and the thing that you don't get, and I, and, and I said information, you know, and you're like, yeah. you like information. And, and when they're born, and, and I don't know about your daughter, but was she your first child? She's my first biological child, yes. Yeah. So uh, Leon was my first uh, child and and so everything's so big anyway. The entire experience yeah. is so big, and then they took them and they took them away, you know. And I was like, "What's going on?" And nobody said anything, you know. The doctor literally put his hand in my chest and pushed me back, and you know I'm like six foot two, two hundred seventy five pounds, and I almost threw the guy through the wall. <laughs> I was like, you know, in the back of my head. But in reality, all I did was just sit there and be stunned, like, what's going on with my son and what's happening? You know, I don't understand. And I think what you're doing is is awesome because hospitals have a little bit of information. You just turn around and say, it's a problem with his hand. We're going to figure it out. It might be his heart, which is one of the reasons they freak out because one of the things that causes it is, is a hole in the heart. So they're doing their, their doctor bit, but 10 seconds to turn around and tell a parent, you know, it might be something wrong with his heart. We're going to look at him. Don't freak out. It's okay. Would have been the world. Yep. It was so traumatic to not have them communicate and give information in that moment. Um, and there are other, you know, we actually went to a picnic of a similar group to yours, and there were a bunch of kids that had the similar uh, hand to Leon's, and that was kind of cool, right? Yeah. It was cool to go and see, like, <clears throat> other people have the same thing. You know, it was very rewarding, so thank you very much. It's very cool. Um, I love my job. <laughs> and we got lucky because we just happened upon that video. I had the, the Google search out, you know, and, and it yeah. went for 3D printers and prosthetics. And I was interested in 3D printing anyway, and, um, and I had it up for prosthetics too because of Leon's hand, and the two returned the video of Liam in South Africa. And I remember, you know, just clicking through and watching it, and the moment that really grabbed me was when he reached over 
with the prosthetic hand and picked up the quarter. And I was like, my God, that thing is great. You know, that, that works really well. And it was 3D printing, so it's I, 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 on a flyer, the names were there. Ivan's name was there, and Richard, and I reached out to Ivan, I think, first, and he was great. You know, Ivan was awesome. He's like, yeah, it's up on Thingverse. Here's the deal. Do you have access to a 3D printer? I said, I actually do. I have a buddy that has a 3D printer, oddly, you know, in like a, um, what's that? Outliers thing. I actually knew a guy that had a three D printer, and so Ivan turned me on to the place, and and uh, and Richard got back also, and we went and we we printed the hand and and we built it, and I you know we kind of set off on this this thing and not really knowing what would come of it, you know, um, and Richard, I guess Richard's more of a carpenter, like he wanted to build it, like we'll build it for you. I'm like, no, no, I want to do it with Leon, like this would be a fun project, you know. Um, I had no idea what kind of a fun project it would be. It ended up being like the best project ever, you know. <laughs> um, so we, we, we built the hand. Um, and like I said, we built it. The first one was, uh, where is it? It was like, this is, this is, you know, we were like kind of daunted. And what, what Ivan did that was awesome is I was looking at all the stuff. It's like orthoplastic and this and that and that. And I'm not mechanic. Am I mechanical? No, I'm <laughs> mechanical. I'm not handy. And uh, so this is literally um, cardboard cut up into a triangle and wrapped in duct tape, uh, put onto a, a, shocker, a soccer shin guard. And that was Ivan. He's like, just take a soccer shin guard and throw that in there and, you know, just get it in there with a screw and some duct tape and that'll get it on. And, you know, that little piece of information took something that was like, you know, daunting and made it really accessible. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I can do this, you know? And Leon was on me to make the hand. Dad, how's the hand coming? How's the hand coming? We got to get the pieces together. Because we got them all printed and we had a bag full of pieces. And he's like, Dad, come on, let's get this together. And he'd lay it all out. He'd lay out the hand and be like, come on, let's get this going. And then Ivan said the soccer bit and then we were off to the races. And then Michael built this thing. We show him the hand. When we saw that thing, go give him a little wave with it, right? Oh, wow. You know, you don't have to go find screws. You don't have to go anything. I built this hand. I put it together in about, we printed it out, so I got all the pieces, and I put it together in about 15 minutes. And it cost us, you know, nothing, right? It cost us because the school had the printer, so whatever the printer thing was. But um, the pins are a great idea, Michael, but the first time we did it, what happened? Uh, when I tried to close my hand, it exploded. <laughs> That's a feature. Are you downloading exploding again? Yeah, you have to download well, the non-exploding. It's not a bug. Hand. It's a feature. <laughs> well, what's cool about it is, um, you know, all this stuff, the open source bit of it. You know, I had an app company for a little while, and my partner was a coder, and he's like, "It's open source." I'm like, "Oh." What's that about? I'm like, well, it's where people write code and they put it out so other people can use it. I'm like, oh, how do they make money off that? He's like, they don't. They just share so that other people can, you know, make it better. I'm like, all right, make it better, but how do you make money off that? He's like, you don't. <laughs> you just make it better. It's a collaborative thing and it helps everybody and it's good for the world. And I'm like, I can't do business with you anymore. <laughs> but I got it. You know, it sunk in and, and so I understood what open source was about. And then when Ivan said, yeah, it's open source, man. Go with Thingverse, download it, and, and it, it was magical, you know? And then so what we did is we, um, since I've got a beta tester, we, we put it on and we used duct tape to hold the pins in. No offense, Michael, but we used a little duct tape to hold the pins in. And you can't really, I actually have a piece. Um, yeah, let's pull out, pull out a gauntlet. So we realized from the beta tester, where's the camera, that um, your hand is convex concave. 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 Your palm is concave, right? So when we built the um, this hand, we used a piece of metal um, that you use that goes underneath your sink that for your uh, Yeah, the, the lead lead, soft lead. Yeah, it's soft lead. Is it lead? Is that bad? I don't know. Anyway. No, it's more of an aluminum. It's, it's yeah. just called leaded tape. It's not, it's just like pencil lead isn't lead either. <laughs> right, right. It's, more like, know, it's shiny, it's metal, it's lead. I mean, it's just like... Well, it's malleable, right? And so yeah. he bend it into position, but when he used it to activate the hand, it would be in a con... Convex. 
convex position, and it would push the object he was trying to pick up away. So I scratched out based on Leon's beta testing. Now, not this one. The gauntlet that we did. The bad one. I sketched out this thing on a piece of paper, and I floated it out to Ivan. I'm like, Ivan, you know, any shot that you could help us out designing this thing? And uh, I've got a bag full of pieces. I'm looking for the gauntlet. Oh, here it is. So we called it the gauntlet, and we sent it to Ivan. And the next day, the very next morning when we woke up, um, because we had we were getting interviewed by CBS Evening News. There's one. Yeah, this is a small one. Um, we we drew this up. And Ivan sent it back to us the next morning, and Leon's science teacher printed it, and we incorporated it into the design. So the gauntlet is in there, and it is con concave. Concave. So when he grabs stuff, it doesn't push off anymore. Mm. And and now you know, you guys have been talking some of the new products that MakerBot's coming out with are, are soft, and you said if we could melt it, we could actually. Um, put something in here that would be soft and a little more of a stickiness to it. So when he grabs things, it would grab. And we're thinking of making an indentation in here and sticking a piece of rubber in there. So it would it would be uh, ergonomically nice, but it, it would grab a little better. And Leon would very much like there to be a laser pointer installed. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. We have a laser Leon? pointer that you could activate when well, you bend let, it. Let's add that to the list, a laser pointer holder. That can but just that can be actually be out. useful because then you can point to things yeah. more easily, right? Because one of the things that I, I thought about this hand is that you can squeeze, but you can't point. Right. Right? Because all the fingers move at once, which is good for gripping maybe, but a lot of times people point or they want to show something or they want to hook something. So yeah. having the ability to have a pointer is actually it's not a bad idea. <sighs> And also, you for sight, you're always like, oh, where's the CVS? Or the CVS is over there. But if you had a 3-watt laser, you could burn a hole in it and be like, <laughs> exactly. that would be useful. Exactly. You Sorry, could I tried to point it on CVS, but I burned it down. Yeah, so, yeah, so I thought that would be interesting. But for the for the rubber, you know what's really good is um, there's this rubber that we had on the that battery holder. It's this special rubber that it's not sticky, but anything sticks to it, and it's used for sticking cell phones onto surfaces. Yeah. Like gecko rubber. It's something called like it's like all I know is like cell phone sticky tape. It's like they put it on the back of of things you can stick your phone onto it. On dashboards. And on cars. dashboards, and it doesn't fall off. But it's not sticky. Hmm. Like it doesn't get dirty. It just. Let's it, put that into the ideas list. <laughs> it's just this weird rubber. Like it's weird rubber. I don't the know other one called. that I've experimented with is there's a product out there that's an air curing silicone called a uh, Suguru. Yeah, yeah, we have that. Yeah, we stock that here. Uh, yeah, and I, I've used that in the past. Just and it, it's basically like imagine the ability to put like a the the grippy part of a tool onto anything. Yeah. So you can it's mix it. It's not sticky though. No, it's not sticky. But, but it's, it's soft. More, it's soft. It gives that little bit of cushioning. Yeah, it's more skin like. A little bit of traction. Skin like. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 More skin like. Grabs. So, kind of the next step. I mean, what's so cool about this gathering and and what Ivan's done and and actually. Um, what we're going to do next term, Leon goes to school at this charter school in Marblehead, and the science teacher, which I mentioned, Bill Sullivan, has been really helpful. Um, and they have these things called enrichments. So the enrichments is basically a parent comes in and teaches a class to the kids, and what we're going to do next term is find some kids with the same situation as Leon and make some hands for those people, like start processing hands, but if we could involve them, that would be cool, right? So I'd love to have them come in and, and be a part of it, you know? I think that being a part of it is kind of makes it cooler for the kid, I think, because it's something they did. It's a little empowering, and you know, which is nice. It's not being done for them so much. It's their part of their own solution. It's their thing. And uh, we're going to do, um, next week, Michael, we're doing a... Um, a brain trust with Ivan and this guy Doug Saban, who's a buddy of mine that helped out, that had the printer, and Bill, and we're gonna um, think of some some adapted ideas because we were thinking, you know, the way Leon wears this right now, and hopefully this is okay to go into, but he slides it on, right? So what we used to do, we're like thinking about strapping and all that. So if we're gonna slide it on, why not make it like a sleeve? 
you know, and really like get the dimensions, get measurements on his hand, like Ivan and I were talking about. Get a measurement here, 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 and make the inside of the tube measure his hand so he can just slide it on with some, like we're talking about that product that you talked about where it would just stick a little bit, not a lot, because mostly his hand holds it in, you know? And then we could, you know, that's 3D, using the 3D printer and just minimize the number of elements that we have to assemble, because the less assembly you have to do, the more accessible it is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to check in with uh, Molly real quick, and then I'm going to have Ivan help us yeah. with the floor. So, Molly, because you talked to so many people, and, and thank you so much, Paul, for that fantastic demo and demonstration and all the things, have you found that um, this type of rapid customization is possible where people are traditionally getting prosthetics at all, or is it kind of one size fits all and you don't see customization? Like, is, is, that, a, is that one of the challenges? Because I'm guessing it is. That, you don't see this much rapid uh, improvements on something if it's not working out for a, a kid or, or whoever. Yeah, when, when uh, traditional, with traditional prosthetics, um, from what I know, um, my daughter doesn't use one, doesn't have one, um, wouldn't be necessarily a candidate for a traditional prosthetic because, again, she's like rocking this. Yeah. So, um, but I know the children, they need to be casted. There needs to be a mold made of their arm. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. There needs to, uh, there needs to be a, a sock or a sleeve that goes underneath the prosthetic to prevent chafing. Um, there's a lot that goes on, and, and I've seen kids' collections of um, their prosthetics over the years as they've grown. They've got the, the hand that they had when they were two years old, the hand that they had when they were four, or five, six, depending on their, their rate of growth. Um, the traditional prosthetics don't really grow with children. And what I'm finding with um, what I've learned about RoboHand is with some um, pretty minor alterations, you can kind of customize um, the small, medium, and large to fit um, to fit the, the the wear. And the other thing I think is really interesting is the recyclability of of it. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is that I heard that you can if somebody grows out of one, um, they could they could send it to somebody else and that person can use it and they could they could be fitted to wear that. Where is if that's the case, that's something that is you can't do with a traditional prosthetic because it's literally made for that one individual. Yeah. Um, Ivan, do you wanna uh, talk about that briefly as we uh, switch over to our screen? Have you uh, heard people saying that's one of the possibilities um, taking all these files and and once these things are made it's easier to customize because you can just change a couple parts instead of the whole thing? Um, that's you know uh, that's that's what I've heard on it, and as far as far as the general s overall size of the design, that that's very customizable. You know, like in in the case of uh, you know we have, we have Leon there, and and Leon is twelve, correct? Okay, cool. So uh, so Leon's twelve, and he the design that he's using was originally scaled for for somebody around the age of five. So the you know by by inputting. By, by comparing the size of his hand to the to the size of the original hand, you can enter in a percentage into the into maker makerware and then scale all of the parts up to his body size. So that so there's a the design very, can grow with you. That's interesting. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a very exciting thing where the, the 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 size can be scaled. Now, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is that's on a linear linear scale. <laughs> Only. So only on, on, on like the x, y, or z coordinates, or all three. But beyond that, currently, um, any other customization kind of has to be physically done. Like um, Michael was talking about earlier, I think it might have been before we were on air, about how you can take some water that's about the heat that you would use to make tea, put the PLA in it, and it becomes flexible, and then you can move it. Um, but one of the things I see is there's potential to use um, the customizer, uh, you know, because it's a free web-based application. Uh, to make more detailed adjustments. Um, I recently released on my own Thingiverse page um, a partial finger replacement, which is a remix of Michael's snap together, a robo hand. So it's basically just one finger of that. But it can be opened in the customizer, and you can input the diameter of the finger stump, the length of the finger stump, um, you know, and a few other measurements. And then it, it adjusts the digital files based upon all of those parameters to hopefully make something that is a closer match to what a person needs. So I guess and kind of a challenge... Ivan, ...is called parametrics. Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, okay, cool. It, it basically means exactly what you're describing, the scaling through use of additional data or the changing of an object, basically an object that has informed rules that are then affected through inputs. If you happen to use, like, high-end CAD software, like I've used Venter, uh, other, like, more than $100, unfortunately. <laughs> um, if, it, if it costs more than $100, chances are it has full parametric design. SketchUp does not, which is kind of unfortunate. But um, I've designed stuff where you can have, like, on the left side, you can type in, you know, something like hand width, hand length, um, you know, diameter of wrist. And if you design the file correctly so that everything is relative, it'll automatically scale in any direction you want. And that's how, like, high-end CAD design is done. They design it so it's completely parametric so you yeah. can change one or two things. The price of that, the though, is first. But it's five thousand dollars. It's five thousand yeah, bucks. The other price of it, though, is while the user experience at the end is amazing, like oh, I just I put in these five or six basic measurements and create this. Not just the price of the software, but the price in terms of time to create that parametric tool is really high. I mean, it's, 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 unless you think parametrically, it's hard. Like I think parametrically because that's how I ta I was I learned CAD in school and it was like high end CAD. But for most hobbyists, unfortunately, it's they don't think that same way because they're not. It's just uh, Leon, not how they're Leon actually thinks parametrically, don't you? <laughs> okay. I okay. thought we would go to the overhead and maybe um, our team here, um, Matt, you can uh, kick it off. Can talk about some of the um, things that we have here, and uh, everyone uh, can chime in, of course. Uh, Ivan, maybe you could talk about what we're going to be displaying on here. Let me uh, switch cameras. Some of these things will look very familiar. I dream of parametrics. So here we go. This is one of the original ones, right? Um, yeah. yeah, that's one of the ones uh, constructed by by Rich over in South Africa, and uh, you know, essentially the function of it is based upon so when it's when it's open there, the distance between the knuckles and the wrist where the uh, cables are anchored, you know, is 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 shorter, and then when the wrist is bent, it, it increases that distance, which causes the cables to be pulled. So mechanically, it's a very very simple, straightforward mechanical system. Um, and then, and then when the cables are released, when the wrist is bent back uh, upward, it uh, there are, there are bungees on the backs of the fingers which have a tension to them, and uh, that tension causes the fingers to open back up. Right. So, yep, and that's that's and what we, we have. Do. Another one, Matt. Do you want to show that one? Yeah, and we have uh, two different sizes of the snap together uh, version, and I'll just take one of them. Now, the snap together version um, I created working uh, with Ivan, uh, the concept here was the original Roborhand version was built to be very, very robust. It was built to, to truly be a daily wear prosthesis. Um, Richard liked to say he wanted it to be able to catch a cricket ball going at 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, <laughs> this was really meant so that it could be built and experimented with quickly and easily. So the 15-minute the build time, I'm happy to hear that. Because that's exactly what I was shooting for. Um, in my experiments, it took me 15 minutes to put it together on my own. It took me 45 minutes to do it with only my right hand, which was my other right. critical thing. I had to be able to do it one-handed. Yeah. Uh, but the concept is that it's it's easier to uh, improve something when you have something in front of you. So the snap together version is a lot weaker than the original version but you're going to get it faster, so faster you can start making your own improvements. You can see what works, what doesn't work. It costs almost nothing to produce, so if you want to cut into it, if you want to duct tape it, if you want to glue to it, you're free to do that as quickly as possible. And if it doesn't work out, you can make another one just as quickly and cheaply. That's great. And uh, I'm going to switch back to uh, the main camera here. Um, so uh, we have, we're very lucky here at Adafruit. We have Matt Griffin, who's a 3D printing expert. You're actually writing a book about this subject right now. Um, what type of things are you seeing out there in, in this world, and, and why do you think 3D prosthetics and open projects like this um, are starting to get a lot of attention? Well, it's, it's been really exciting seeing this space exploding. There are a lot of uh, really exciting developments in medicine in general that... Uh, have been popping up in the news and you're hearing about uh, for 3D printing. But prosthetics, these things are happening right now. And the work that people are doing 
is having an immediate positive effect. People are able to get involved. And, uh, and you have a couple of things happening at once. You have uh, people who are approaching and trying to solve this problem as a community and, uh, and you know, exchange you know, tips and tricks and improve the base models and get these to the people that need them. Uh, but you also, as a result, have a whole bunch of people who are looking at all the problems and questions as a designer and engineer uh, involved. And they're learning a lot of things. And they're finding a lot of interesting uh, behaviors and uh, potential ways to make these a natural part of people's lives. And uh, so there are a number of uh, interesting projects out there. There's the Open Hand Project, uh, Anthromod, um, and the one um, project that was created really more to make a, like a, a human size uh, 3D printed robot uh, the InMove project uh, has been really influential in helping people find ways to deal with the scale of you know, a human limb, how to solve uh, getting all the types of behaviors and gestures and grips that they might want to have. So you have this way in which people on uh, exploring robotics right now are sharing these ideas with the people who are, are activists and are really wanting to uh, help you know, get these things affordably to people. So you have this interesting exchange back and forth and just some amazing work. And like Lamore was talking about earlier, when you, when you take the 3D printed possibilities of mechanically solving this and you add in electronics and feedback, suddenly you have these projects that are still affordable and still are sort of like maker projects that are extremely uh, amazing. They can do so much. They can it's possible to pick up very fragile things and grip them tight enough to drop, not to drop them without breaking them. And um, so this is all coming sort of back into the world. People are sharing what they're finding. And so uh, some, of the, some of the kids who are grabbing these and you know, incorporating them into their lives are able to extend them and, and accomplish things that they wanted to do with them. Um, by taking advantage of that uh, open source and community development. Yeah, um, and Molly, again, because I'm going to ask this, because you seem to have access to so many people. Do you think it's important that uh, participation, um, I, it was great to hear from Paul and, Le and Leon, do you think participation about this with the kids is a, is a, is a, is a crucial piece or an interesting piece or, or something that, uh, that makes this happen? I, I think I think having the kids involved is a great idea, especially if it's something that interests them, um, and if it's something that they can work on with their parents. It's something um, that they made together. Um, I think that it, it it kind of adds value to to the piece that they're using rather than just having something given to them. Um, and I think for a lot of you know a lot of kids, you know, they love Legos, they love building things. So to have to ha to be working on something like this and have it something that they could use um, on a daily basis um, in and around the house and in their lives, I think would be really exciting for them. Um, so absolutely, I think that's, the participation is would be great. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a deal breaker, but I think it would probably, um, in my opinion, it would be the best, uh, the best option going forward. Right. And for your project in particular, the, the Lucky Finn project, um, what are the big challenges and, and needs that you see with uh, that the people watching this and people who are doing 3D printing and people that are um, uh, maybe they have a 3D printer and they just want to dedicate their time to um, helping out? W what things um, could they do to help this uh, effort along? Um, reaching out um, to the Lucky Fin Project and letting them letting us know that they're they're willing if they have a 3D printer and they want to get on board with this um, it's going to be all about making connections um, about um, people you know putting you know offering up the use of their 3D printers and then um, the candidates so it's just going to be it's it's just going to be connecting people the the people who can build it and the people who want it, and then how we can get the exchange going, and then uh, once it's in the home, um, that family can begin working on it themselves and tweaking it to to suit their needs. And uh, how is that happening right now with your project? And then I'll I'll go back to uh, 
Ivan and um, Paul, because it sounds like they connected up, but how is it happening with the Lucky Fin Project? How do people connect with others? Through the Lucky Fin Project or with RoboHand? Um, well, through, through your efforts and, and what you know of, uh, of RoboHand. Um, well, everybody, um, we have a very strong Facebook page, a very strong Facebook page, and um, we get, a, there's a lot, um, a lot of, of communication and back and forth through, um, through that. We are followed in all 50 states in over 27 other countries, so we're global, um, and it's always about sharing information. Um, what somebody has gone through um, in Australia is, is, is valuable to somebody who's in Ohio and they mev may never cross paths but um, getting that information of been there done that um, and, and I've been there too is so important um, particularly for new parents to know that they're not alone and as the kids get older and realize that that they do have um, a visible difference um, if they ever feel that they're alone we can show them that they're not and actually they're really in some exceptional company um, going forward with RoboHand, um, we, I haven't, I, like I said, we have a, a few people that I'm aware of who've come forward and said that they've been using um, and posted about using the RoboHand. I think um, something I can do is reach out to the community and, and look at um, and ask who has been using one of these and how's it going for them and then who's interested in getting one. And then again, it'll just be connecting the dots. Great. And uh, Paul, um, since you're kind of in the, the center of this, it looks like it worked out well that you've connected with Ivan. How do you think other people uh, out there can either donate their time or um, what can they do to, to help, our, help out this effort? I think that, um, you know, having someone like uh, Richard Van Oss who's actually right. making these hands for people is awesome because just getting the hands on the kids is great. For me personally, it was rewarding to do it myself. Some people will like that, some people won't, but I think what the 3D printing does, you know, what 3D printing brings to it is that you can do it yourself if you want to. You can go ahead and reach out. If you can find someone that has a printer or get a printer or if there's access to it through, through one of these uh, uh, communities of people with similar issues like Molly's, uh, like the Lucky Finn Project, um, you could say, all right, I can get it built, but I could also build it myself. Um, and... You know, if you build it yourself, if you have access to the printer, this thing, we expended, you know, I don't know, we stole Bill Sullivan's duct tape, so I didn't spend a penny to build this thing. <laughs> to be honest, you know, we took Michael's design and Ivan's design, you know, and the school's printer. Um, that's not true. I brought, I bought the elastics, which I think were $3, and uh, the string is fishing line. It might have been 3 bucks, um, but I've been using that on all of it. So I'm not saying that's what everybody's experience is going to be, and some people might feel um, that to have someone do it for them, you know, Richard's making it with orthoplastic, so it it's a form fit custom thing, you know. So do you want a fun project, you know? Do you want to be part of the open source and make it better, or do you just want one? And if people have that option and they go, oh, I just want one, boom. Well, at least they have an access to a place that can do that for them. Or if you want to do it yourself, you can do this. And you have options. I mean, having options, what's better than options, you know? And I think that's what 3D printing brings to it, the option to do it locally and, and take this design and make it real yourself, um, which is awesome. For, it's been great for us. Okay. Has it been great for us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to switch it over to Ivan, and I'm going to turn on the question and answer feature on this Google On Air Hangout. So if you're watching and you have questions, um, they'll start to come in, and we're going to... Uh, see which ones uh, come in, and we'll try to uh, bubble them up to the uh, participants here. Um, Ivan, what are the things that you're working on right now with the different um, features and modifications? And, and also, uh, uh, allow you to ask the team here, uh, okay. what would you like to see uh, as far as electronics that would go in uh, okay. to these types of things? Cool, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to say th thank you, uh, guys, for teaching me the, the, the term uh, parametric design. That's, that's awesome to know, to know that now. Um, uh, so one of the things I've been working on is talking to Paul about, about just that, you know, the, the sleeve he was describing. If we could fi figure out a way to make that a parametric design um, and available, th th that would be an, an avenue to have more customization kind of done on the front end so that when it's printed out, there's less adjustment needed. Um, as far as tools to do that, you know, it, it is kind of a bit more difficult, as, as Lamora was saying, 
Um, but you know, the nice thing is OpenSCAD is a is a nice free um, uh, tool. It takes a little while to to get to know it, but using that in combination with the customizer um, uh, on Thingiverse gives at least a pathway for those that are interested to to experiment with it, but don't have the money to buy expensive CAS, you know, the more expensive CAD software to at least be able to get in there and mix it up and, and see what sort of designs they can come up with in that in that way. Um, so that's kind of an exciting thing. That's that's kind of the plan with between, you know, Paul and I and the other folks we're going to talk to and then, you know, the, the beta tester, Leon, is to see can we come up with a parametric design using these free tools that can increase the ease of assembly and fitting for Leon. Um, one of the questions that I have uh, for for the folks here today is, um, you know, regarding the electronics, um, you know, how how easy? I, I have a rough background in in industrial automation, so I I know a little you bit can about. Put a PLC on it. Yeah, exactly. PLC. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna put a PLC on it. No, okay, sorry. Continue. <laughs> Well, or is, there, or is there something similar to it, to a, a very small scale I/O device, you know, uh, input/output device that could be used in combination with the sensors that would be low cost enough to take, because the the hand as it is currently is a series of cables. So those cables each could be hooked to a servo, you know, um, and then with myoelectric sensors or maybe other different uh, kinds of sensors, it, would it be theoretically possible for somebody to come up with some sort of system for less than? Two or three hundred dollars that could read some sort of signal and give feedback to those potentially with with no you know the, who are missing their hand here or yeah or, or have limited wrist function. Um, so it's actually an interesting question. I actually don't know tons about. I mean, I know a little bit about biofeedback. I've done biofeedback projects. Um, one thing I know about biofeedback is it it's um, it's cheap to do something simple, and it's really expensive to do something good. <laughs> um, which is a little unfortunate, but what, one of the things that's interesting is um, from what I know about the DECA arm is it doesn't use biofeedback. I'm pretty sure it actually uses um, ankle movement. So the hand movement echoes the ankle movement. So you move your feet and then your wrist and hand mimic that. And I don't think it uses biofeedback, although I would like to check that out because mm -hmm. it's an interesting solution to the problem. The problem with Biofeedback is when you have sensors on your muscles, and you can detect stuff like your muscle squeezes. But the problem is, is that if you have clothing or um, you know you twitch, it'll it'll set it off by accident. It's it's easy to control it, but you can accidentally set it off also, which can be frustrating because you have to like train a lot. Um, EEG is really really hard. Like some people say, oh, I want a brain controlled arm. That's really really hard and really really expensive, unfortunately, to to get the quality signal out of your brain. Uh, first off, you have to shave your head, which is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> Although, you look really cool with a mohawk. Um, but uh, it's really hard to get good quality signal. You can get something out, but again, is it worth it to have a flaky behavior? You know what I mean? Like, is it is it, is it worth it to have a hand that kind of, like, uh, stutters sometimes instead of uh, moving only when you want to? So these are, are trade-offs. Um, you can, however, add servos pretty easily to um, a hand. There's little servos that are plenty strong enough, and a battery pack would fit on it. You can do stuff with vibration motors, which are uh, like pager motors, which are little discs that are used in phones. That's what when you have vibrate mode, it's a little motor that jiggles back and forth. So you could have something like a feedback that would you, that would be easy to detect. You know, if you if you're touching something and you and you can sense that you're touching it too hard you can get a buzzer feedback. So that's something that isn't very difficult to do because you're not trying to read muscles. Instead, you're relying on the human brain to read that buzzing feedback and, and detect and be like, ah, that means I'm squeezing too hard. You can use, um, there's basic sensors that are pressure sensors that aren't even that expensive. They're like seven bucks. And you could have one for each finger. And so when you squeeze, it would tell you, oh, stop. You know, you're going to crack that egg or kitten or whatever you're picking up, um, you know, you're, if you don't have practice with the arms. So these are these are some of the things. It's easier to add feedback that way from sensors than it is to try to get muscle and brain sensor input. Paul, did you have uh, a sensor or a, a, a something that you'd like to see? Yeah, I had a question. I like, you're talking about it. One of the things we've been talking about, if, you know, activate the hand, right? They all go together, right? What would be cool is be able to have him to articulate them Independently, so that if he were to, so he has. We'll pull this off. Show me your hand. 
So if he were to take his hand and to move it a little to the left or a little to the right, yeah. then we would have the fingers do this and this. You know, your hand's very complex and cool. So in my brain, it was like having like one of these mouses on the pressure plate of where he presses. I mean, actually, I was thinking of it in physical terms to a degree. So he pushes a little on the left or pushes a little on the right, and it activates the fingers in a different way. And you said, how can you bring electronics in it? And like just from this conversation, which is what's great about all this stuff, by talking with people, it's like, oh, well, we could do that with an electronic thing and a servo that would give a boost. So if when he presses mechanically, that's the activation. But if he presses a little this way, there'd be an, a servo boost that would make one hand go a little bit more than the others. Right, and then he could he could have a sensory where it didn't need a lot of sensory, right? It doesn't need to be a very, it could be like a mouse or an iPhone screen or something, where you just uh, you add a little bit of pressure and it would allow you to adapt the movement uh, like this, because you know, and then the thumb you know has to come around if you could have a thumb around, but but when you when you're grabbing things like this, you, you your hand moves in different ways, right? Yeah. Our hand does all this crazy different movements, so if we that's one of the oh limitations. I mean, you're describing using uh, you know, the, the solutions we see in our world every day, the touch mouse or the, the screen, but even what you were describing before with you know, the little $7 pressure sensor, something like that, if you, you think you've, you offset your hand to the left or the right inside the gauntlet, you know, one of those pressure sensors could determine, are you pushing against the left side, are you pushing against yeah. the right side, and that could result in an offset force being applied by a servo. It doesn't need to be complex. Totally. But, you know, there could literally be just a servo that tightens the strings on one side and releases them on the other to give you that bit of an offset. Yeah, they could be attached to a pulley at the back, a small pulley, so the servo doesn't even have to be at the finger level. The servos could be back on the back of the wrist here, and they could be activating like on a, on a pulley. So it winches a little bit more here, and each one has its own little... I mean, I don't know. I'm not that guy, but... One of the things that's really exciting about um, basically people working with robotics coming together with people who are really uh, focused on like the, the user experience of interfacing with this kind of hardware is you have people learning things like with the InMove project, how to get the kinetics and inverse kinetics going to have a, like an arm move that sort of you know, feels natural, which is actually pretty complex. Um, all crammed into a very small space, at, at least difficult to work with as far as something that you're putting together yourself. So you combine all these uh, clever ways to solve getting natural movement with uh, clever ways to, to get you know, feedback and, uh, and to trigger things. And so you, what, I'm really excited later in this, this month to be able to interact with folks at like Anthromod and um, Open Hand Project because they are really focused on trying to bring some of these things together, um, and uh, you know, make make that make the this kind of triggering part of it. And there are ways that you know one one group or one you know people focus on one aspect will find uh, a little really clever trick, and that will come back in a very different way in somebody's else somebody else's design. Yeah. And then you will have uh, much more natural behavior than you would than one designer might have come up with. So we do have a question that's all that's very relevant to the time we have left. Um, the que the question is where can I find more information about um, the the different people that are uh, in this chat tonight? So we'll we'll start with Ivan and then Molly and then Paul. Um, Ivan, if someone um, saw this and they want to start generating ideas and modifying your files or doing things, where can they find out information about your efforts? Um, well, you know, as far as the the, the designs on here tonight, um, the, I think the best place to go would be to go, would be to go to Thingiverse and do a search on Thingiverse for RoboHand because there's um, a whole bunch of there's a, quite a few different remixes, people that have been playing around with the different finger lengths, etc. There's Michael's design, um, so there, there's different iterations. Actually, Anthromod um, was the, the, they took the initial kind of skeleton design of, of the, the robo hand, which was kind of blocky, and, and it was I think it was Chris Chappelle that smoothed that out and improved the aesthetics, and that was really awesome. Mm -hmm. So I think that's um, for those that want to download STL files and maybe play around with it or even just ch check it out, that would be the best place to go. Okay, and for the folks out there, as you um, download these things and print them out and share them and have or you have sketches, put them in the uh, community pages that we have up, and uh, that's all, that's why you're here, you're watching this. Um, you can go to uh, google.com plus Adafruit, 
and uh, forward slash plus Adafruit. And you can find the community of makers, hackers, artists, and engineers. And you can post up these things if you have questions, you have ideas. Um, and of course, uh, searching on Thingiverse uh, for these things on to remix, mod. Uh, Molly, if people want to get involved with the Lucky Fin project or find out more information, where can they go? Um, they can go to www.luckyfinproject.org, and they can look us up on Facebook and Twitter at Lucky Fin Project. Gotcha. And uh, your group does take donations, is that true? We certainly do. Okay, great. And uh, and you're still giving out bracelets, or is that <laughs> every day? Bracelets, t-shirts, bumper stickers, you name it, we got it. Excellent. And Paul, um, is there some place online where you have some of the things that you've worked on with uh, Leon, or just uh, files or anything? We've been negligent, but we'll we'll start posting some YouTube videos, and we'll probably post them up with Ivan, and 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 put them up on Facebook and stuff too. So we've been a little negligent in that because uh, you know we've been living. But uh, <laughs> we'll we'll start posting YouTube videos. Ivan's got some great videos up there. Robohan's got some great videos up there. Um, probably what I should do is is do a little um, you know step by step. You know, hey, welcome to this. It's not crazy. This is how we did it. So we haven't done it, um, but we will do one. <laughs> okay. and then, I'll go to Ivan. Look for Ivan on YouTube, and and I'll, I'm sure he'll repost anything I put up. So Ivan Owen's YouTube page will probably be the place to go. Okay. And Ivan, another question that came in is, what tools do you use for all of your work? Um, for all of the work in general, or just... uh, yeah, well, the software that they use to create oh. these models and everything. Yeah. Um, I I use um. I use Net, NetFab Basic, which is a, a free version of NetFab, um, mainly to cut apart STL files, that kind of thing. Um, but my, the primary design tool I use is OpenSCAD. Um, I've done a tiny bit of work in Google SketchUp, um, but that's uh, it's between OpenSCAD and then uh, Makerware for scaling and, and then printing. That's that's what I that's what I use. Okay. All right. And with the last uh, couple minutes left, uh, you know, this is all about ideas for this month. So it sounds like. Um, Laser pointer holder is one, right? Yeah, I'm going to get started on that. Different laser materials. Yeah. <laughs> Different materials. I'm lasers yeah. on everything. Um, uh, what other what other things, uh, Ivan and Molly and Paul, um, would you like to see generated from this session that maybe people can work on? Um, slide on. I like the slide on ability so that it can slide on and be comfortable and rounded. Okay. Um, it's very angular right now, so I'd love to have it be more rounded so there's less uh, pressure uh, angle points so it doesn't hurt. It hurts them in places we have bandages on it. Um, I'd love to see, I think the next design, someone designed a knuckle that has the fingers out like this a little. We're going to do that. I'd love some ideas. I have some sketches on making the thumb be not just this, but also this, so parallel to the index finger. As a, and also out. So I was thinking of like a slider that would allow to be one position or the other. Um, you know, I could go on. I mean, there's a lot of ideas that come up. I will connect with all you guys and just start the forum. And just engaging with it and asking questions and offering ideas um, is always helpful. And I'll connect with Molly too and, and get my information to her as well. So if anyone wants to talk to someone who went through it, we'd be more than happy to talk to anybody. Is that cool? I would love I would love that. I'd really appreciate it. How is um how's Leon liking the hand? How is he adjusting to yeah? How's he liking the hand? Um I like it. Uh it's not super yeah. comfortable. That's what we're working on. Um Yeah. But but it works and it's it's pretty cool. How often do you wear it and for how long? Um I don't wear it a lot like very often. I wear, it, I wear it occasionally, and um, I'll wear it for like the the whole like I'll wear it for like the whole school day. So well, you wear it to school every day? Uh, not every day, but sometimes. I mean, as probably the case with you, I mean, since he was born this way, there's not a you know he can do a lot the way he right ate, exactly what the hand doctor said. So what this does is kind of allow him. As we grow with it, there's a couple uh, goals we want to hit, milestones. So being able to carry stuff was the first. So he can carry bags and his lunch bag, and we accomplished that. And then um, we were able to ride the bike. So we adapted it so if you grab onto the bike, so it slides under the gauntlet, and then the hands lock in. 
So that was mm-hmm. another goal. The next goal is being able to tie his shoes. So we're like clicking off these things that he can't do and trying to conquer them. So those are our milestones. The next one is tying shoes. I'd encourage you guys. I think it would be awesome. You mentioned maybe doing some videos. Um, one of the great things about the project being open source and being available for anybody to work on is that you know everybody's ideas go into it and make it stronger. Um, so even if you could just like show a video of each of those goals and how you chose to accomplish it, it can help so much by helping other people out there trying to do similar things just get ideas, get their mind going on how other people have adapted it and how they could potentially could expand on your adaption. It's it's embarrassing because it's like the barber's kids have the worst haircuts. I actually make videos for a living. So, <laughs> of course. Embarrassing that I have. We need to we it. need to make a hand that's specifically designed for playing Xbox games. I think that's. Yeah. See now we're talking. Yeah, That'd that's what cool. we like about the cut the customization. And then um, Molly, I had one last thing before uh, we end the show, and we'll also check in with Ivan real quick. Um, would it be helpful if there was something on Thingiverse? that a creator could say, I am looking to uh, help someone out there. I make all these things. You can contact me. And it would be specifically for 3D prosthetics, because you're saying you know, the matchmaking is the challenge. Would that be something if we talk to yeah. Um, yeah. The, the Let's say that. the 3D evangelist at MakerBot. Yeah, because, <laughs> because it'd be nice to be able to hang the sign up and say, I am looking to help someone. So they and, have this and you guys have done this before. You did this with the pulleys on the original MakerBot, right? We've, you done, have people... this, we've done some matchmaking. We, you know, I'd have to, we'd have to see exactly what could be put together with the community and what could be put together with... I mean, Thingiverse isn't really designed as a matchmaking tool at the moment, but that's something that we could explore. And start to use ask, the comments field. About. Yeah. Well, the grant writing, um, you know, Leon's teacher got a grant to to get a 3D printer, and what? He also got a 3D scanner. He got a scanner too, and uh, Mr. Sullivan got these. If he put out there, hey, this is the grant. This is what I wrote, verbatim. Here, go see if you can get some funding and get your school a 3D printer. It's the future, yeah. right? I mean, that's why I was interested in it. 3D printing is definitely the future, so it wouldn't hurt for kids to. Um, to have exposure to one at an early age, and 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 you could do good with it. I mean, I'm sure we're at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, prosthetics, one thing. I'm sure there's 50 million other things we haven't even thought of that you can do with it. Okay, and Ivan, is there anything uh, that you'd like to uh, see uh, the folks work on out there before we uh, wrap up the show? Yeah, um, just a- any any ideas that can lead to um, making it easier for individuals to 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 build these on their own. Um, I, you know, in a perfect world, this is kind of just a hypothetical, of course. In a perfect world, it would be great to see, you know, fo- folks that connect up, connect with with Molly's organization on Facebook, and say, okay, I've got a printer, and I'm willing to produce parts. And then, so so there's somebody that's willing to produce and ship parts, and then you have person that that is a candidate for for a device and and wants to try it out. And then you have folks like Paul and Leon who have built one at home, and then they're like, okay, this is how we built it at home. So that's a way that a lot of people could be reached um, by de- you know the awesome thing about three print- three D printing is the potential for decentralization of the idea and the, and, the, and the production of that idea. So um, anything that that people can contribute towards I, um, concepts that aid with um, make, making it a, you know easier as a do-it-yourself project would be a really cool thing to see too. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, so much. This is fantastic. Um, We're going to be here next week at 8 p.m. That'll be a half an hour one. And then the week after that, another half an hour one. And then the end of the month, the last uh, Friday, um, also at 8 p.m. for one full hour. And that's when we're going to try to see what's happened within this first month. So I want to thank Matt and Michael and Lamar. And I want to thank Paul and Leon and Molly and Ivan. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your amazing work and efforts. This has been fantastic. Um, This will be uh, posted up on YouTube, and anyone can watch this later. Um, Please join the uh, makers, hackers, artists, and engineer community. Post up your photos, ideas, and sketches. You can also post in the YouTube comments. And thank you, everyone, who are asking questions. And also, uh, thank you uh, to Google for helping to put this together. We'll see everyone next week. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. So long. Thank you.